So any company that I see that is positioned really strategically and is really foundational to the workflow of their end user, um, I think that's the number one thing that gets me excited because it, it shows that they're yeah. going to be able to build a large, large business over time. Hey, what's up everybody? So thanks for joining this edition of the Data Nerd Herd. Today we have Brian Offit, who is a principal uh, VC at Index Ventures, a leading venture capital firm that focuses on investing in technology, data, and AI startups. Um, we talk about Brian's path into data and technology uh, at Palantir and MemSQL. Um, I think his path is actually really fascinating and slightly hilarious, as you'll find out. And then we also talk about his transition into uh, being a, a VC. We also discuss his thoughts on the explosion of the data tooling space, we cover what makes a great VC and how he evaluates investing in companies. It's a wide ranging conversation. I think you're going to learn a lot. Um, and we kind of end talking about our, our shared interest in punk rock, skateboarding and, and surfing. So it's definitely, a, I had a lot of fun with, with this discussion and I hope you enjoy it. Hey, Brian, what's up? How you doing, Joe? Good. Good to see you. Likewise, man. Likewise. Yeah. So today on the Data Nerd Herd, we have uh, Brian Offit. For people who don't know who you are, do you want to give a quick intro? Yeah. Yeah. Happy to. So uh, I'm Brian Offit, as, as you just mentioned. Um, I'm an investor here over at Index Ventures, where I focus on investments in anything with a technical buyer. So that spans a wide variety of different types of technologies, security, data, traditional software infrastructure, uh, and beyond. Um but yeah, anything with a technical buyer is kind of where I spend my time. Reason for that being uh, prior to Index, I was at Palantir for a number of years working on a variety of uh, infrastructure projects as an engineer and then a product manager. Uh, and then I was at a database company that is now called Single Store that some folks wow. call MemSQL yep. as a product manager. And there I was focused on everything that wasn't query execution. So deployability, monitoring, management, all that good stuff. That's quite a bit. <laughs> so... And you find your way into VC, which we'll, we'll get into in a bit. That's cool. I mean, how did you find uh, yourself in the tech space, uh, you know, in the first place? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I actually grew up on a farm in Maryland and had uh, dial-up internet until, gosh, what well, must have been like 2004, 2005. Wow. At which point we, we got these cards you could stick into a laptop that would go through the cell network when 3G mm. became a thing. Um, and so, you know, I never thought that I would find myself kind of working in high technology, so to speak. Um, but I was always interested in kind of fiddling around with computers and stuff like that. And then I went to college, um, and I knew I wanted to be an engineer because I liked math and science and all those sorts of things, but I didn't really know what type of engineering. And so I took a bunch of the different intro classes, uh, you know, electrical engineering, material science, all that good stuff. And then the last one I actually took was computer science. And what struck me about computer science as opposed to the other disciplines I had tried out was, was two core things. Uh, one was the instant gratification of it, right? So the beauty for me of, of writing software code is with a relatively rudimentary toolbox, you can build some really interesting stuff. Um, versus if in electrical engineering, right, like you'd spend an entire quarter making an operational amplifier that kind of works and you're like, oh, this isn't nearly as good as my, the speakers in my iPhone. And so that really resonated with me being a relatively impatient person in many ways. Uh, and the second one, which is an extension of that was the creativity of it, right? Because you could do so much with this rudimentary skill set, it felt like it unlocked a, a creative part of my brain that it just didn't feel like was um, as readily accessible for some of the more traditional engineering disciplines. Uh, and so, yeah, I kind of fell in love with it and, and then went and decided to major in computer science and here we are. That's awesome. And so you, you finished CS and then did you get a job straight into Palantir or how'd you uh, find yourself working there? Cause that's a pretty prestigious company. So yeah, yeah. Like many good things in life, it was it was serendipitous. Um, so basically, I was on the swim team in college, and I swam pretty competitively. And um, 
so we swam all year round. We had a week off in the winter and a week off in the summer. And I was, I went to Stanford and I was at uh, school for the summer, still training, but I wanted to intern. And so uh, I had a friend named James Fosco, who was in a public speaking class of all things with me. And he interned at Palantir. And I found out that Palantir was actually directly across the street in Palo Alto from no the way. Pool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Totally, totally hilarious. And then I went, okay, well, uh, I'm going to apply there through James. He referred me um, because if I get a job there, I can go to practice, hop on my bike and be at work in 15 minutes <laughs> without needing a car. And so I, I applied. Uh, luckily enough, I ended up getting a job and, you know, ended up interning there for the summer of uh, my junior year and then eventually joining full time afterward. That's pretty hilarious, actually, because it was more kind of an, a convenience thing, actually, it seemed like versus a. Uh, um... I mean, because that's, that's a job I think a lot of people, you know, would want to want to get or an internship people would want to get. But it's I find it's funny just because it was uh, you had to fit it in with your swim practice, too, in order to uh, make it work out. So it's pretty hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. I got very fortunate. I had a couple of folks, um, you know, over a Palantir one interview that, that kind of took a bet on me, despite mm-hmm. being relatively, you know, one of the interesting things about a lot of folks who applied for those jobs is that there's a lot of people who have been really coding for a long time. Right. Um, and I hadn't. Right. Uh, you know, I, I declared computer science my sophomore year. This is about a year later. So my tool kit for being an intern was actually relatively, you know, uh, lacking in comparison to some other folks. But I think I found some people that uh, really took a bet on me and and luckily, you know, ended up doing a pretty good job over the summer. But cool. it's something that's actually really stuck with me throughout my career. I think finding people who are willing to to take that bet on you, I think, is one of the most important things um, as you're building out a career, because sometimes you need someone else to tell you that you can do it before you realize that you can yourself. That's so true. Early in my career, I had the same thing. Somebody took a bet on me. He had no business taking a bet on me, frankly, but he did. So, um, that worked out. Right. But, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I just saw serendipitous. A lot of things are uh, in careers and, and elsewhere. So that's, that's pretty fascinating. We can talk more about taking bets on people in a bit. I got some more questions on that, but, you know, so after Palantir, um, you know, you went to uh, MemSQL at the time. Um, that's a cool database, by the way. I really like it. Yeah. So, and what did what did you what did you learn uh, working, um, you know, sort of in the, in the guts of a, a data technology product? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, at, at Palantir, we were writing. I was doing infrastructure projects, but it was always one layer above the hmm. database layer, right? Because we were building application software. Um, and we had built out some stuff internally that was very database-like, right? Like we had um, an in-memory uh, columnar store that we used to do uh, fast slice and dice analytics, um, amongst many other things. But I never worked on like something that foundational. Um, and in college, I didn't have that much experience with it either because I didn't take an operating systems class or anything like that. I did the artificial intelligence track uh, of, of the computer science major. And so when I joined MemSQL, I think the first thing that really struck me is like the, the amount of engineering rigor that goes into developing foundational technologies like a database mm-hmm. and the impact that that has on things like uh, release velocity, the impact that has on things like testing, right? Uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that's probably the biggest thing that I took away from it is um a lot of learning on how to like really, really, really test something in a way that you absolutely have to in a data, a foundational data system where, you know, bugs are really big deal to have really big impact. Um, that's number one. And then number two, just a respect for, you know, I was working on product there, not writing code, but a respect for the complexity of, um, and the brilliance of the software engineers that are writing this stuff, because with those systems, you care about every little thing from a performance perspective, every little thing from a memory utilization perspective. Um, And I was just kind of blown away. In some ways it reminds me of, you know, the joke, I have a lot of mechanical engineering friends. The joke I always make is, you know, mechanical engineering is real engineering because, you know, the plane has to fly. (laughs) Right. And databases, I feel like, are a little bit closer to that world where you might work on a plane for 
you know, 10 years. I don't actually know what the timeline is, but yeah, it feels like that. I used to be an ME student actually before I switched into math. And so, but I remember my professor was like, um, you know, we'd go through uh, materials classes and you'd say, yeah, I mean, so you better know what you're doing because if you make a bridge and it falls down, people die. (laughs) It's like, yeah, that's a good point. Um, So then I got into math and nothing dies there. So it's it's a bit more abstract. So um, that's really cool. And then from MemSQL, I mean, how did you find yourself into the investing end of things then? I mean, that's quite the uh, transition there. So Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, it was very, um, you know, I think this is a very classic venture capitalist thing to say, but it was uh, very unexpected. So (laughs) It was, that is, yeah, yeah. You know, um, it. I really liked working on product. I, I really enjoyed it. To all the points I mentioned earlier about creativity and, and building a thing and taking an idea in your head and, and facilitating that idea uh, becoming a reality is something I quite enjoyed. And so when I left MemSQL, I actually thought I was going to go back to school to do product design, which um, is is kind of the uh, you know if you think about it, infrastructure engineering is the lowest level piece of that puzzle product design, I think is almost the most abstract piece of that puzzle. Um, and the most creative in many ways, though, I, you know, I think writing code is also quite creative in its own way. Um, but I got reached out to at the time by a couple of recruiters at uh, a sort of venture capital firms. And it was again, serendipitous, the timing was right. And I was kind of thinking about what I might want to do next. And so I took the interview, frankly, mostly out of curiosity, right? And I figured, you know, venture to me at the time was this very opaque thing that like happened in ways that I didn't understand. I didn't know what happened really in the board meetings, but I knew there were these, this thing that happened. And so I was really curious um, and a little frustrated by how opaque all that stuff was. And so I figured, okay, well, if I do these interviews, I'll at least have some light shed on that, that I can, you know, absorb and then share with my, my friends. And what I found is that I really liked the, the interviews. Like I legitimately enjoyed uh, the interview process. And I think it, it came down to two things that I realized about the job that turned out to be true that really resonated with me. Um, the first was, you know, it's an exercise in need finding, much like product management, Mm -hmm. right? But instead of trying to find the need within the database market, you're trying to find needs in a much higher level space, right? Um, Which might be all of enterprise software or all things related to technical buyers. And I really enjoyed that. And number two, it's a, you know, uh, I viewed my role as a product manager as being fundamentally a support role. Right. My job was to make sure that the engineering and design teams had everything that they needed to build the best product possible. And what that meant at any given point in time could change. Right. It could be perspective from the market. It could be help organizing release process. It could be help with hiring. It was quite dynamic. And I think the same is true of being a board member. Right. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you don't run the company. And your job is to make sure the people that do have everything that they need to do that as effectively as possible. Um, and I quite like operating in support roles like that. I find it very rewarding and quite enjoyable. And so the combination of those two things made venture resonate for me. Um, and then again, I ended up getting connected with index and meeting a bunch of people that I really, really enjoyed spending time with. Um, and that took a bet on me, you know, I, coming into the job knew, I mean, quite literally nothing about the financial analysis side of a venture. Um, but I got very fortunate. I had a group of people who said, you know what, I think this person can figure it out. And now we're here. It's really cool. I mean, what was that? What was the learning curve like to become a VC? Um, and was there like a VC for dummies book that you read? Or I know there's venture deals out there, which is kind of the canonical uh, first book that I think a lot of people read. But what, what resources did you find? Because I think I agree a lot with what you said. The, the VC industry as a whole just seems very opaque, um, very black box-ish. It's, it's like you're either a VC or you're not a VC. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of good materials out there where back in the 2000s, I remember VCs, it was very opaque. Like you were not going to understand what was going on, nor were they going to let you understand. And now it seems that the walls come down. A lot of VCs are pretty open about how they do stuff. And um, But yeah, I mean, what's, what was the learning process like for you? 
Yeah, it was, uh, it was hard. It was hard for sure. I think the way that I approached the job was, um, to be very patient with myself. And in some ways it's like a sales job where, um, for those, you know, not familiar with how the intricacies of sales works, you usually have a ramp, right? And the expectation is that you're not contributing meaningfully to revenue until some period of time, which is called the ramp. And then once you're past that time, you're expected to contribute. And what that number looks like varies depending on the product you're selling and all that good stuff. And venture is very similar, right? There's a pretty long ramp period for anyone, much less someone coming from um, a non-investing background. And so I kind of made a conscious choice at the beginning of my time at Index to only focus on learning rather than getting frustrated by the fact that I couldn't yet deliver results. Um, and so I just spent the first six to nine months as a sponge, right? I would go to as many pitch meetings with as many different folks at Index as possible um, across all sectors, not just infrastructure, just to see how different people on the team framed questions, how they thought about opportunities, um, to get a sample size for what a good pitch looks like, right? Because I had never really seen any of those. Um, and again, it, it, it really does come down to the, the time investment that the folks I work with spent on coaching me, right? Mm. I, I don't think that there's terribly too much out there. Unfortunately, I think it is getting better on, on how to do this job. I really do think you have to find people who can kind of teach you the ropes. And I've been very fortunate to have some amazing folks at Index um, help me do that. And then in addition to that, you know, coming from an operating background does actually have some advantages versus coming from a financial background. And that's that in the early days, uh, I could spend my time looking for companies that would have been relevant to me, right? When I was working at MemSQL and Palantir, which can actually be really helpful in narrowing down opportunity sets to things that are likely to be revenue generating. Because you can go, well, I probably would have bought this and if you assume that you're at least more or less similar to a lot of other buyers out there, it can help you find some pretty decent companies. So I think it's the combination of all of that coaching on the intricacies of um, the venture specific stuff, and then leaning on that operational expertise to help actually find opportunities and evaluate them. Right. Yeah. It reminds me a lot of like the uh, role of like a, a record, uh, a and almost kind yeah. of having to find new acts and stuff like it. I know in my role, even having to find new partners and new products, it, it's the constant thing, like which, how do we evaluate all these different companies out there? And we'll talk more about the explosion of tools in a bit in the data space. But um, I mean, how, how do you go about evaluating uh, a company? Do you, do you have a rubric or, or what, what are some, some things you look at? It's a great question. Um, what, what I find really interesting about this job is that every single person does it a little bit differently and you have to, you can't kind of copy paste how another investor goes about the job. You have to figure out your own way of doing it. And as a result, the people place more or less importance on different things. And I think there's a common set of things, which I'll get into that are relevant to everyone. And then how people distribute the weight of importance, I think varies. Um, I think the things that are on that rubric are generally speaking, size of market opportunity, you know, short answers, you want it to be big, uh, quality of team. There's many different ways to break down quality of team, right? Uh, relevant experience, uh, you know, network, et cetera. Uh, and then sort of thematic product direction. Um, and this is for early stage. If you're doing growth stage, you also have kind of metrics on growth and revenue and all that kind of stuff. So we'll put metrics into a fourth category. Uh, for me, it's really all about um, the, the team and the product vision. Uh, the team, because, you know, at the end of the day, I've seen projects with really great people um, uh, that are going after the wrong idea work out because the really great mm -hmm. people figure out it's not the right thing to do. They change it up or they cancel the project. This is more internally when I was working at companies. I've also seen really great ideas, really great projects get taken on by teams that aren't very good and they'll find a way to screw it up, <laughs> right? Yep. So the team is really prerequisite to anything, I think, working out. Um, so it's the number one thing first and foremost. And then also, of course, you know, on a more emotional level, you're gonna be working with these entrepreneurs, working with these companies. And so 
you just want to work with people that you enjoy spending time with. Mm, yeah. I would say that's, that's an underrated piece too, right? Because uh, I think just the, the, I guess, being pleasant, um, having a pleasant experience with people, I think it, um, it shapes a lot of how the outcome uh, works out for you guys. Um, like I know for us, like we, we will intentionally not take on clients if we think they're just going to be a pain to deal with because um, it's opportunity cost, right? We can be working with a company that's more pleasing to work with. So yeah, totally. Totally. The thing I didn't appreciate though, that's an extension of that um, mm-hmm. is how, just how much that impacts the likelihood of the company succeeding too, because mm. if you find someone enjoyable to be around and you have a conversation with them and you leave being like, that was a really enjoyable conversation. The likelihood that other people feel the same way is quite high, right? which is an incredible proxy for whether or not that person will be able to recruit. And as I mentioned, you know, the fundamental, most important thing for pretty much any company is the ability to attract great people and great talent. And so it's actually a huge positive signal if you like working with people because it it reflects on how they're likely to recruit. That's a, that's a really good point. How's that going right now too? I mean, it, recruiting right now is insane. Uh, I know in the, in the tech space, um, I mean, are you seeing any, any trends um, with, with your portfolio as well in terms of maybe practices uh, for recruiting uh, sort of an aside question, but it's something that's been on my mind a lot lately. It's just the attraction of, of top tech talent uh, in a market that's just absolutely bananas right now. Yeah, uh, it, it is totally crazy. I think, um, the trends are it's gotten more competitive, right? And in general, um, I think that's particularly true for certain roles that are kind of uh, nascent, uh, but in high demand, right? Mm-hmm. So things like, hey, I'm an infrastructure company. I need someone who can help run a cloud managed service, right? Mm-hmm. There's only a few companies that have run, run a cloud managed service at scale, um, but there's a ton of companies that want to do it at scale, right. which creates a natural scarcity. Um, the second one that immediately comes to mind is, uh, developer relations, Mm -hmm. right? Relatively nascent role. Every company wants one super, super high demand. And so I think I've seen trends around people having a difficult time hiring for those roles. So if you're looking to make a career shift, (laughs) good places to spend your time. Um, and then I think as a result of this competitive overall competitive market, um, I think compensation is, is going up, right? The amount that will people are willing to pay. Uh, folks who join their company is increasing. When you combine that with the fact that the venture market overall is very hot right now, mm-hmm. um, it means companies have the cash to actually go and do that, right? If you used to you know, raise a $15 million Series A and now you're raising a $20 million Series A, just as a, for instance, you, know, you can put some of that capital towards higher uh, salaries for your people in order to better compete in the market. So the biggest trend I think is is you know increased crazy demand combined with um, a rise in what offers look like from a compensation perspective in order to combat that. Has the rise in compensation affected um, the amount that you, you'd pay out in a, in a Series A, for example? Uh, can you clarify by payout? I mean, well, I mean, so for if you, if a company wants to raise a Series A, I mean, you kind of indicated back in the day, maybe it was ten million. Now it's twenty, might be thirty pretty soon. Who knows? Yeah. Um, I mean, how, how much of that is um, reflected in the increase in salaries, for example, like a company just needs to raise more money simply because it, salaries are going up? Um, or is that more of a factor of kind of just hotness of, um, uh, uh, of just a company or the space or something like that? Yeah, I think it's actually that the, um, the amount the companies raise and the valuations are going up. As a result, companies get more money. As a result, they pay people more. Okay. So I think it starts with the rising valuations. Mm. And I think the root cause of that is actually, you know, there's a lot of um, talk in, in the media and all about uh, rising valuations, which I think is, is valid because the, the rise has been pretty notable in recent years. But I think it's actually fairly rational market behavior, especially at the early uh, stages, because, you know, we've seen with companies like Snowflake, Snowflake's a $70 billion company. Right. And so if you're a venture capital firm trying to compete to win the Series A, someone offers to invest in the company at $120 million valuation and you can win the, the deal by doing it at 180. Well, you're like, you know, 
obviously you prefer to do it for less, but ultimately you want to be in the $70 billion company. Um, and so I think that's driving valua- early valuations up, which then gives companies more capital to pay out to their employees. Interesting. I guess a question that's been in my mind is, does every company need to be a unicorn? It's a great question. Um, uh, no, I don't think so at all. Right. And I, I, you know, I think there are certain businesses that have the size and shape of what makes sense to be a venture backed business. Um, there are some businesses that don't, right? And I don't think one is is inherently better or worse. It's just that there are certain markets that are conducive to, you know, $50 billion companies. And there are some markets that aren't, right? And then there are some teams that want to build $50 billion companies and some that don't, right? Um, They want to build more of a lifestyle business. And I think that, you know, that's equally as commendable. The thing I encourage entrepreneurs to think through is like, uh, you know, think through which one is the one that you want, right? Because once you take a large... Um, investment from a venture fund, you know, you're kind of taking a, a rock and t- taping it to the accelerator, right? right. Yeah, it's something I see a lot. I think a, a lot of entrepreneurs, I know they, they all want to have a billion dollar company, but at the end of the day, yes, yeah, it's, it's been in my mind too. Like maybe, maybe you aren't going to be, maybe that's fine too. Like your idea just isn't the type of company that's going to be a snowflake. Right. And so, but maybe that's fine. But I think a lot of people try and force the unicorn thing onto themselves versus the other way around. Like, because we have a company, we have to be a billion dollars versus is this actually a billion dollar idea or, you know, maybe we should find something else or just be happy with where we are. So it's interesting. Um, Kind of on that note, there's an an explosion of data tools. We we talked about this earlier. Um, What are you seeing in in the data space right now with respect to that? Um, uh, number of tools, types of companies. Um, what, what's what, what? What are you seeing? Yeah, yeah. There's there's a couple of ways to cut that question. I think first and foremost, there's been just an absolute explosion of data tools. Um, and what I find interesting about it, to kind of frame a- any further conversation, it is what's fascinating to me about the data market is it's actually one of the oldest markets in enterprise software. Right? Databases mm-hmm. have been around for a long time. Um, and historically there's been a couple of key ways to make money in data. Uh, you can move data around, you can visualize and organize data, you can query or run compute of some sort on it. Right. So in that framework, like spark counts is querying, even though it's a little bit different than SQL, um, you can store the data, uh, and historically you've been able to make pretty good money backing the data up. Right. And if you look at history, each of those cat, each of those buckets has kind of a company or a set of companies that attack the entire piece, right? So moving data around is historically kind of ETL tools on the um, analytics side and some sort of enterprise message bus on the operational side. Organizing and visualizing data is some flavor of uh, BI. Um, Query is, you know, obviously a database or something like Spark. Storage, oftentimes tightly coupled with um, the query layer in a database. And then uh, uh, backups are kind of its own thing. What's interesting about the data market right now is that all of those categories have been fragmented into smaller and smaller pieces, right? So you no longer have an ETL company that handles the entire journey of the data. You'll have an EL company and then a T company and then a reverse ETL company. There are three separate, separate companies. And the same is true, I think, of all the other, the other categories as well. And what that's made for is a pretty complicated uh, data market where companies are kind of piecing together the best of breed tooling for, um, to create the stack of their choice, right? which I think has an enormous pros, but also enormous cons, right? Um, the pros are you really are getting uh, to pick exactly what you want for each piece. The con, of course, is that you have so many tools to manage. Okay. And I think the reality is right now, a lot of these companies are early in their journey um, from a commercialization perspective. They may have a lot of venture investing, but not necessarily a lot of commercial traction. And I suspect over time, there'll be a big consolidation as all of those companies start to commercialize and have to kind of compete for the same 
budget. Um, and folks have a harder time justifying paying for four tools and instead we'll end up standardizing on one. Um, so that's kind of on, on the kind of business landscape perspective. I think the second thing that's more exciting is that there's a lot of tooling that's facilitating a lot of interesting best practices um, within data that are being borrowed from software engineering. And I think tools like DBT and Dagster, uh, amongst many others, are, are really um, making huge strides in that regard. That's interesting. So we kind of went from Informatica to like, uh, I guess, parsing out Informatica um, into various startups. And then I guess consolidation would mean what's the next Informatica at some point down the road, right? So um, it, it's an interesting cycle. The um, What tools, I guess, is there a particular space that excites you in data right now versus others? Or are you kind of equally enthusiastic about the entire space right now? Yeah, I think I'm pretty enthusiastic about the space overall. I think, um, you know, Obviously, I have a portfolio of assorted companies in the data space, but I'll, I'll, I'll spare everyone from this becoming a, a sales uh, uh, marketing opportunity. I think the things that I think about most deeply with regards to the data market, which is maybe a, a good way to answer your question, um, is what are the places that have the most strategic injection points so that when this consolidation happens, they are the path of least resistance to eating adjacent products market. Right. Yep. Because I think that is going to be what makes or breaks um, the assorted businesses in the data space right now. Uh, so thinking through D and I think the example I always give is if you think about GitHub, GitHub is very strategically positioned because they started at the beginning of the journey with source code management and they initially monetized on collaboration around code. And they integrated with things like CI, CD, issue tracking, et cetera. Um, but because of their injection point in their wedge, they were able to go, you know what, we'll build GitHub Actions. We'll add GitHub issues. Now they're doing an IDE, et cetera, et cetera. So any company that I see that is positioned really strategically and is really foundational to the workflow of their end user, um, I think that's the number one thing that gets me excited because it, it shows that they're yeah. going to be able to build a large, large business over time. Right. It's like a lot of overlapping spaces is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. I see that yeah. a lot. Um, what are some challenges that are occurring right now that you see in the data space? Yeah, I think there's two big challenges. Um, you know, uh, you know, number one is it's noisy, <laughs> right? Um, like I said, there's so many companies there's not just so many companies taking on smaller and smaller problems with adjacent competitors. Mm -hmm. For any good idea in data, there's also increasingly three or four folks going after that exact thing. Right. Often all of whom are well capitalized, right? Um, and so competition and cutting through the noise has become really challenging. So I think that's thing number one. And I, I think uh, what you're seeing as a result of that is a lot of data companies hiring someone in product marketing earlier in their journey to help them craft the narrative and get their message out to the market. Um, and to kind of really put a stake in the ground and say, we own this space before someone else gets there. Right. Even the product is going to be a couple months, you know, later to actually get released to the public. I mean, that's interesting. Given what you just said, though, you know, lots, lots of teams, well capitalized, all smart, all hyper focused on the same problem. How do you determine who wins at the end of the day? Like, how do you pick the winners in that situation? Yeah, yeah, I think it does ultimately come down to the team. Mm -hmm. but picking the best team uh, is the most important thing. Um, but like you said, sometimes that's hard too, because oftentimes it's not like, oh, there's one team that's way ahead of everyone else. Often there's lots right. of great people working on the problem. Yeah, I look at some of these companies, they're all like clones of each other, like Sanford, um, Google, X Facebook, starting a new company focused on whatever in the data space. But there's like four other companies doing the same thing with this almost this exact team, like carbon copied. And I'm like, I have no idea. Um, we'll just choose all of them, I guess. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's tough. You know, uh, I know for us trying to find partners, it's like, I, I don't know sometimes how to choose the company to partner with because they're all great. Um, none of them suck. And that's the whole thing right now. It's like you used to have bad data products. Now 
data products are all great for the most part. It's hard to find crappy data products. I mean, you can if you try, um, certainly, but um, you know, there's there's some great ones out there. Great engineering, great teams, great marketing. So it's really hard to cut through the noise. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you're totally right. I think the thing that I come back to is there's lots of smart people who can build great stuff. The thing that I think really differentiates the outlier founders is they have a a point of view on where the market needs to go, mm-hmm. which is different than like, there is a need in the market right now and here's how we're going to fill the need. I think a lot of people can do that because if you've worked in data for long enough, you felt certain pain points and you can go yeah. down certain points. It's having a point of view, which is like, here is the way I think it should be done. Uh, and I'm going to do whatever I can to make that vision into a reality and make that the way that everyone does it, right? Yeah. You also mentioned DevRel earlier. And I think that's another big thing. Building the community is something I look at a lot. Like, do you have adoption, traction with customers that like you a lot? Um, if, you, if it brings you joy, I suppose that's a good metric or it brings customers joy. And so... That's one thing I, I start to look at a lot more. Um, do users actually like the product uh, or do they tolerate it? Um, you see this all in the connector space, for example. Data integration is huge. It's a bajillion companies out there at this point, all connecting whatever to whatever. But um, like Fivetran does a good job. Airbyte does a good job, I think, of getting traction, right? And so that's in building community and building buzz. And that's half the battle. And so Yeah, totally, totally. I think it's something that Snowflake did really well too, right? So, oh, they killed it. Absolutely yeah. killed it. And if you look at the way that they they structured their business, they were really aggressive on uh, sales and marketing. Oh, jeez. On right. I remember two, uh, 2016 being taken to like lobs, you know, nice dinners and lunches, and being you know showered money upon. It felt great. Um, you know, it's like who are these guys? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it makes it makes them one of the it makes them part of the conversation for everyone who's driving or sorry, driving, think about buying a data warehouse yep. and that's half the battle. And I think what you're getting at with distribution is, um, is a really great point. And I think there's a lot of value to becoming the default choice, particularly in spaces where there are many choices that are kind of the same, mm-hmm. right? It's like, you know, uh, Coke and Pepsi are like different, but like kind of the same, but for yeah. whatever yeah. reason, Coke is seen as I think for most people, the more desirable choice. And I think it's right. branding. It is. It's completely branding. And I think that's something a lot of people miss too, because it's all about features and sort of getting into the, the better trap. Like our product's better. It's, I can tell you the kinds of pitches that I don't like. Product pitches are those where it's like, well, but our, our product does exactly the same thing there does, theirs does. I'm like, I don't really care about features. Like those are, you can build those, right? I and mean, at the end of the day, it's kind of like, do I like the product? Does it make me feel good when I use it? It sounds totally corny, but um, like when I use Snowflake, I like using it. It's a great tool. When I use Fivetran, it's great because I don't have to think about it, <laughs> you know, yeah. so. No, I think um, the way I put this is people, it's important to remember that people buy products, not technology. Yep. And there's a reason why I pay way too much money for an iPhone because from a specs perspective, I could get a way better phone yep. for way cheaper, but the product experience is fantastic. And, and the community ties into that, you know, like if people want to, if you get people excited about associating with your tool, you know, it's no different than selling, you know, you're selling sneakers, right? It's right. a very similar phenomenon. It becomes a part of their identity professionally as opposed to part of their identity um, stylistically. I think DBT did a really good job at this back in the day. Like you're part of the cool kids club. If you're using DBT a few years ago, you still kind of are, but it gets really cool back then. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think it, it qualifies the other um, thing I mentioned earlier, where I think the team over there has a strong opinion on Mm -hmm. the way to solve this problem. And it's an, it's an opinionated framework and that opinion resonated with people. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Um, kind of switching gears, we talked about organizations before we uh, start recording. I mean, what, what's been on your mind with respect to, to data and organizations? Yeah, totally, totally. So I like think we were talking about earlier, I think along with this tooling has come a lot of excitement around how this tooling might solve a large a whole myriad of problems that data teams um, experience, right? And I think there's 
there's the infrastructure tools, which don't really help with this. I'm talking more about kind of the workflow productivity tools, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think DBT is a great example of one, right? Like I think DBT is a framework whose primary uh, value add is it dramatically improves the productivity right. of right. analytics teams, right? Which I think is fantastic. And that's just one, for instance. I think the thing that um, sometimes people I can get overly excited about is, oh, well, tooling is going to solve all of our problems. And mm -hmm. if we buy this tool, then we're going to be magically solve all of our data team's problems and we're going to be in this magic world. Um, and think a little bit less about how we can structure data teams organizationally for success. And I think one of the things that a lot of these tools have done, which is really fantastic, is to borrow from software engineering, right? Things like testing, um, version control, staging and production, all of that good stuff. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to learn from software engineering uh, from an organizational perspective as well. Because my perspective is that tooling is part of the reason why software engineering teams are so efficient, but it's actually largely organizational, right? Mm -hmm. There's clear expectations of which team owns what. There's clear contracts between teams via APIs, right? Um, there's modularity within code that allows you to say like, oh, okay, this is this piece of the code belongs to this team and this piece of the code belongs to this other team. Um, and the expectation is if you break someone else's stuff, they're allowed to yell at you, right? So I think that's kind of organizational stuff within teams. And then I think there's also this meta-organizational problem of, you know, in all companies, it's whether you're in marketing or sales or recruiting or any function, it's kind of known that like shipping hacky code is bad. And so everyone kind of gets like the engineering team has to take time to make sure this thing actually works because if you put it in front of customers and it's hacky, then they'll be upset. But in data, I feel like there's an expectation from the business that they want the data as soon as possible, as quickly as possible, right. whatever that means. Um, and so I think the other thing we, we need to, to get to is a place where the entire company understands that it's actually better for data teams to maybe take a little bit longer getting them the report that they want so that they can do it in a more sustainable way such that the next time they ask for a report, they can get it immediately. Interesting. How does that happen? Uh, you mean, how do you restructure uh, teams like that? I think expectations, uh, what you're driving out with getting reports, maybe, you know, a, a bit later and so forth. Because I think the expectation in a company is like, where's my, where's my damn data, basically? Um, you know, and, and we've all been there. Um, or the data is wrong. Why? And I want, my, I want my wrong report uh, now, you know, so I've actually seen that happen too. Um, I mean, for non-data people, right? The, the data is kind of an abstract thing. It's just like, well, it's data. It's just a report. So yeah, I think, I think oh, go, go, on. Oh, go for it. Yeah, I think it's hard, right? I think, um, and I think all of these things boil down to cultural expectations, mm. right? And to be honest with you, I think overcoming cultural expectations at organizations that already have them in place, as anyone knows, whether it's data culture or any other company culture, right. it's excruciatingly painful to change, right? Um, so the first thing I would say is if you are a new company laying a foundation that uh, from a culture perspective that is like, hey, we want to make sure the data is right. You business user also want the data to be, to be right. So be patient with us such that we can mm -hmm. get you the right data as opposed to the fast data, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's number one. And then I think number two is actually using some of these tools to make sure that from day one, you are laying the correct technical foundation right. that's scalable over time, right? In the same way that when you're building a software product that you're serving to customers, you're constantly thinking, okay, cool. You know, Here's what we need for the next six months, but will that scale? in two years, applying the same thinking to your data foundation, I think is a big piece of it as well. Um, within large organizations, I think it's harder. My observation with regards to any sort of cultural change, not relevant to just data, but I think it's, it could be applied is find pockets of the organization where you can start to change it within that pocket. And if you can start to do that and people see the value and they go, oh, wow, actually for this initiative, we had the best data and it was way better. You can slowly start to spread that culture yeah. throughout. So 
if you're a data practitioner in a company, it's a matter of trying to find people on the business side who will be champions for this approach um, and start small. That's good advice. I think uh, diplomacy is going to be, be a big part of uh, being a data practitioner too. So yeah, that's interesting. Kind of back to the foundational thing when you're, when you're early. I mean, what, what, what do you think is a data foundation? I always hear this term bandied about, but I, 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 and I know I use it all the time. I, I don't know what it is though. <laughs> So what would you consider a good data foundation? Yeah, I think it depends, right? Um, I think the other thing with, with data right now, which we also talked about a little bit earlier, is, um, you know, I guess the first question you'd ask yourself is, what does data mean to my organization? And, you know, back into it from there. I, an illustration, right? I think in the data world right now, you have a, a number of kind of blessed data stacks. Right? You've kind of got the Snowflake stack, which I think of as being Fivetrans, Snowflake, DBT, and then increasingly some of these reverse ET ETL tools. You've got the Databricks stack, which is kind of its whole self-contained thing where they build a, a bunch of the pieces and maybe you use something like Airflow or, or some other scheduler to get the, data, the orchestrator to get the data in, but that's kind of its own wall garden. And then you have this kind of emerging stack built around Trino and a bunch of other open source technologies kind of on the data lake side of things. So I think the first question is to ask like, okay, which, which of these stacks is most relevant for me? Hmm. And if you look at the users of each of those, they tend to fall into actually pretty different categories, right? Mm -hmm. Snowflake is very, very popular with um, folks who are doing data analytics to do reporting, dashboarding, all that kind of stuff. Databricks is really popular for folks that are doing kind of more data science-y type of stuff, which kind of makes sense given that's been their whole angle and, and it's Python and all that good stuff. And then the open source stuff on the kind of Trino side of things tends to be people that are doing um, data lake type of things, which in general is people with very, very large data scale and or people who are using that data in some sort of operational capacity, right? So Step one is to go, okay, what am I trying to actually get out of my data? Am I serving it to customers? Am I building models with it? Or am I building reports with it? And the answer might be all three, but I think that's question number one. Um, and then number two is figuring out um, the very, very challenging, and I wish I had advice for how to do this, but I'm not a data practitioner. I am an investor, um, piece of actually modeling the data within your organization. Mm which is a cross-functional effort that includes basically everyone at the company. Um, and I think at Palantir, this was kind of one of the big things that we brought as a value add. So we will go into customers. We had this thing called an ontology, which is basically a model of the world. You had objects that have properties and links. And we would work with the customer to map out like, what are all of the entities that you care about as an organization? And how can we make that into this ontology, which then got converted into a schema? Um, I think that's being very thoughtful about that is probably the number one most important thing. Yeah, I would agree. That is such an underrated skill, data modeling. I think everyone wants to jump into the tools, and that's fine. But we see a lot of instances where, you know, Snowflake, Databricks, whatever. But the data model is an absolute disaster, or it doesn't exist. It's just we've got a lot of data in stage. We'll just use that for whatever, for production as well. And it just, yeah, yeah, data modeling, I'd say that's huge. Thanks for bringing that up actually, because nobody ever talks about that part. Yeah, totally. So, and I mean, and the challenge is it's not like, did, like in software architecture, you know, it's a decision that can be made by a couple of software architecture architects in a room. And if they're experienced, they can go, here's why this makes sense for now. And here's why this will make sense in five years at scale. Right. And it's pretty self-contained. The challenge with data is like, you need input from kind of everyone. Right. <laughs> um, and it's actually much harder to predict what will change because businesses, functionally, practically with data, you're modeling the business, mm -hmm. which changes a lot. With software architecture, you're going, okay, cool, we might have more users. Like the number of variables that could change and expand is a pretty known set. Whereas with a data model, you don't know what you're going to care about. In. Right. The best book I've still seen is Agile Data Warehouse Modeling, um, riveting title, but uh, but it goes into sort of, uh, treat it like a journalist, right? So it's who, what, where, when, why, and how. 
And that sort of represents how you're going to model your data. I still think that's probably the best methodology I've seen in terms of just talking to people, talk about it in their terms. Don't talk about it in terms of like facts and dimensions that nobody at all cares about except for data modelers, but really just get to the heart of like, how does this work? Um, like in your day to day, how do you make decisions? Right. And try and model that out. It's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it is, it is, you know, to tie it back to some of the best practice from software engineering, which is, you know, my background, there are similarities, right? Where as a software engineer, if you're building something early on, you design for flexibility. Right. right? And you go, okay, cool. I know that these foundational components are likely to always be relevant. I don't really know where we're going to build on top. So I'm going to design them to be, to be flexible by nature. I think doing the same with your data model versus kind of hard coding, this is exactly what the world looks like. Right. <laughs> Big part of it as well. That's a huge part. That's awesome. Kind of closing out, you know, switching gears, you know, you're a VC, you're a busy guy, but what do you do outside of work? I mean, what makes you tick? I know when we met in Salt Lake, we talked about skateboarding and surfing. Um, um, yeah, what, what do you, what do you like to do? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I, you know, my colleagues would laugh and say all oh, hipster stuff, you know, <laughs> but uh, it's not a bad answer. You know, I'm really into music. Uh, I like film photography a lot. Um, as you mentioned, I, I have been getting into surfing, so that's a relatively recent thing, but um, I'm pretty hooked. I got to tell you, I, uh, I split time between Santa Cruz and um, where my girlfriend lives and then uh, the outer sunset in San Francisco. So the access mm -hmm. is pretty good, but that's, that's my insane. That's so cool. Do you take like the one down to uh, Santa Cruz then for surfing or? Depends. Depends how much time I've got. Okay. <laughs> the one is the much more pleasant route. It's a, uh, it's probably an hour and 45 minutes, mm. but um, you can take the, the, the big highways and with, um, with COVID, I mean, there's no traffic. It's kind oh, of really, I think I'd want to be outside right now. That's crazy. No traffic. What? So <laughs> yeah. Huh. Yeah. That's, that's me, man. I, I, I like, that's I right. collect a, a lot of records. Music I think is probably my number one passion outside of work. Um, nice more recent do you play like uh do you uh produce music play music or what do you what do you do play guitar that's cool that's awesome yeah. what kind of what kind of music do you like to collect i'm all over the place man so i've got a couple of records behind me but i never i didn't notice that i'm just kidding <laughs> yeah there uh this is a small piece of the collection but it's some funk music some metal music some bluegrass uh that's in the, I, 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 you know, I hate to be the person that's like, I listen to anything, but I will listen to pretty much anything. All I'm the, the same up. way. Yeah. I think as long as it's not like kind of poppy and lame, I'm into it too. So like people who actually take a, a shot at making good stuff is what I kind of like to listen to. Like I was listening to like a, some random hip hop on my way here, um, you know, home and stuff. And it's just, uh, there's a lot of good music out there these days. Totally, man. Yeah. And it's so easy to find, you know, and yeah. I, the, the, the genres of music that a lot of people have trouble listening to, I thankfully listened to when I was like 13, which is an age where you can deal with, you know, <laughs> like what kind of music, like black metal. And <laughs> it's like the best kind of music. <laughs> yeah, I know. But a lot of people can't get on board with the, the screams, but you know, I see 13 year old skateboarding. Brian was all about it. So oh, that's right. You still like a lot of punk music then too. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I was listening yeah, to so yesterday. I was listening to uh, Gorilla Biscuits yesterday, the old 80s punk band. Oh, yeah. Love Gorilla Biscuits. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I love that whole, uh, there's a great documentary um, called American Hardcore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Love it. There's also a great <laughs> documentary out right now about the descendants on Amazon. No way. Yeah. Interesting. I'll have to go watch that. I know they're still touring. So that's interesting. That's music from like my uh, teenage years as well. So. Descendants grew up watching uh, old like Santa Cruz skate videos and stuff in the eighties. And actually it was kind of cool. So um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Tony Hawk had the uh, vert alert comp here in Salt Lake. So they had all the pro skaters from the eighties show up like Hasoy, um, all the guys. Yeah. It was so insane to watch. That was cool. So and they just played nothing but eighties punk music the entire time too. So like all the, all the cool ones. So you felt like you're in an eighties skate video actually when you're watching them yeah so. like an old bones brigade video <laughs> it totally felt like that yeah so like uh caballero was there you know the whole nine yards so it was cool so that's awesome yeah, yeah we do a podcast on that you know 
<laughs> he probably could. <laughs> yeah. Joe and Brian hits. So that's cool, man. Well, I think we're coming up on time, but yeah, great chatting with you. I'd love to chat again. Um, you know, you got an article coming out at some point, so I'd love to chat more about that and uh, give it some support. So um, for people who want to learn more about you and, and find out more, how would they uh, do that? Yeah, I think the, the best mechanism is probably my Twitter, cool. um, which I will check right now, but I believe is just my first, it is my first name, last name. Whoa. Yeah. Brian off Good job supporting that one. <laughs> you know, what's funny. I remember where it happened. I was actually skateboarding at my friend's place. And one of my friends in high school was like, I got this Twitter thing. And we, it was when you could do it on your phone, like on your old, like, I think you could actually, um, maybe I'm forgetting. You could SMS text back then. Yeah. That's what I yeah. remember. Okay, cool. Yeah. 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 Cause I was one of the first people on it too, back in the day. So yeah. then I just deleted it a couple of years ago, but, uh, uh, but yeah, that's, that's, yeah. I was like, wow, you got a non weird name. Like you got your real name. That's, that's insane. So yeah. that's cool. Well, it makes my life a little bit easier, but yeah, that's the best place to find me. Okay. For Brian off it at, yeah, at Twitter. Awesome. Brian, it's good chatting with you. Uh, a lot of good, uh, ideas coming out of this. Um, I know I got, I took a lot of notes here. Uh, just a lot of things I didn't think about with data too. So it's been great. So always appreciate our chats and hope to have a, hope to do it again soon. So yeah, likewise, Joe. Appreciate awesome. it. Hey, take care of it. All right. Take care. See ya.